My name is Jeff Sprott, and they used to call me the... years, London's underworld had been dominated by three men, Billy Hill, Albert Times, and Jack Spot. My name is Jack Spot, and they used to call me the governor. But all I did was to defend the Jews. Whitechapel, East London. Since the turn of the century, home to thousands of Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe. They were easy prey to local English thugs, but the sons of the refugees did not stand idly by. One of them was Jack Comer, better known as Jack Spot. I was always on the spot where Jews were being sorted out. You never knew that? That's why they called him Jack Spot. Everybody in the line had a nickname. Born near Petticoat Lane, Jack Spot grew up in the heart of the Jewish instead. It was a tough life. I was fighting every minute because they used to hate Jews like poison. I tell you, they couldn't, they wouldn't pay for the suit. We order a suit and they make, make, they come to the wooden pay. They never went to the basin. They had bets with Jewish bookmakers and never paid. You understand what I mean? When they lost, they wouldn't pay no money. So what function, what did you do for these tailors or for any other East End shopkeeper? Well, I used to stand there. Once I was there, they paid for everything. Spock became a sort of hero to Jews for his street battles with anti-Semites. In 1936, he was singled out by Oswald Mosley for leading a violent attack on Mosley's black shirts as they marched through the East End. But by this time, Spock was combining community protection with protection rackets. He had become a gangster. Spock relied, indeed, upon muscle uh, and, of course, the menace which was, uh, you know, the grimace and the half sneer on his face, which in any sort of dim light uh, could be very, very frightening. And you could well understand that somebody running a cafe or a restaurant or something else when confronted by this man who loomed closer and closer to you, his face shaking and his eyes in slits, uh, would, would, would indeed uh, be very, very uh, frightening. Spot's menace was reinforced by the razor. My brother learned to be a barber. It took a very long time. And whenever I come by, I used to hide it and lock up the razors. I used to take razors from him. Holograms, a hologram is a wide-fitting razor. A French razor is a thin blade. I knew all that. Everybody carried a razor. Or a stiletto or whatever. I used to carry a flip knife. So I had to use a razor sometimes because they never come one handed, always a mod. So when they quit, boom, 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 and they used to run for their lives up the arse around here, I made sure not to hit, cut them on the jaguar vein. Why, why not? Once you cut the jaguar vein, finished. So you didn't, you didn't want to finish them? Of course not. I don't end up for murder, do I? It's a question of me and people know that you had it. If you had it, you wasn't interfered with, but you didn't have it, you was, well, you couldn't, you couldn't work in the West End. Everybody would, you know, ah, he was nothing. He never carries at all. I can't tell the ones looking for, to shoot me, what was his name? And I said, you looking with me? He said, yes. And as he pulled the river out, I did my cut around there, the scenic railway. Bastards. I was never afraid. Very often the villains were uh, slashed with razors or knives and finished up in Channing Cross Hospital, mostly Channing Cross Hospital, uh, where we always approached them uh, and they always gave us some spurious answer that they'd fallen down and cut themselves uh, and that there was no action to be taken. But the one particular case, uh, the man, uh, said that he was uh, convinced uh, that uh, it was Spock. And I went to interview Spock. Uh, and he put on this rather menacing act without 
in fact, uh, assaulting me personally. He nevertheless leered uh, with his hooded eyes. He said, who said it, you know, and uh, who you think you are? And this was his sort of attitude. Smith's racket was protecting illegal gambling clubs. In the late 1940s, this earned him thousands of pounds a week and social respect. And Jack Spot uh, epitomized all that there was about the, the old-time mafia-style gangster. Uh, he was always immaculately dressed. Uh, he always looked the part. He would come out of his flat every morning, go over to the station and go into the barbers and, and sit in the chair whilst they uh, did his hair and gave him a shave and so on. And then in his brown suit and, and uh, a brown overcoat and, and a brown fedora hat, he would march down Edgware Road and receive the accolades of people that, that uh, said, hello Jack, how are you Jack, and so on, because he knew everybody. And then he would walk down to the Cumberland and into the Cumberland in a place there called the Bear Garden, and then he would sit very discreetly at a table near to the wall, and then he would receive people in much the way that uh, Don uh, Corioni did. But Spock had his eyes on another gambling racket, protecting bookmakers at England's richest racecourses. Before World War II, criminals from London's Italian community, led by Darby Sabini, controlled racecourse protection. They used to go round there with two, two sticks of chalk and a sponge, well, not a bucket. They would get you a sponge, a bookmaker sponge, dip it in a bucket. So he's got a wet sponge, give him two pieces of chalk, because in those days they used to work off the, the joints, and every one of them had to give a donation uh, for a dollar or half a quid or whatever, put in the bucket. So at the end of the day, all the bookmakers all ran the track, whether it be Epsom or whatever, right? Oh, I just get whatever. Oh, well, the bucket would be full of money. And uh, that was it. There was numerous fights. And there, there was people, racist fights and budget and coaches and all that in those days. Because whoever was the strongest kept, kept the, 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 the income. I mean, kept the, 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 you know, that particular thing. The weak, the weak, uh, at, at the story. Sabini set up the original Bookmakers Protection Association, but during the war he was in turn with other Anglo-Italians. Their absence from the tracks allowed other mobs to take over, until finally Jack Spock muscled in. The same down Epsom, all the modern threads, you see. At Epsom, I controlled Epsom. I had to go with bookmakers, Jewish bookmakers, and stand by the bag, because they were being robbed non-stop. And if anybody had a bet with them, they wouldn't pay. But if they won, they won the money. Now the main protector of both the racing rackets and big city gambling, Scott Williams was courted by an ambitious thief who spent many years in jail. Billy Hill. He was an out-and-out out thief. And a good thief. Very, very good thief. He had a reputation for being a very, very safe, good safe brother which I know he'd known all for me. The biggest safe bra in England at the time was a burden of men and already married Bill's sister. There was one occasion where he uh, broke into a jeweler's and a fat old policeman on the beat stood there and down the stairs came Rita Billy Hill carrying the sofa, which must have weighed a colossal milk. And he did all this by what he termed dynamic tension. And he carried this down, and the old policeman said, hello, 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 because he did say things like that. And Billy Hill uh, dropped it, but of course, dropped the safe, but there was no way out. Billy Hill was a small kind operator, you understand? And when he came out of prison, he knew that I was running clubs and all that, so he tried to mean that he wanted it. So I said, okay, so I took him to my tailor, made him a suit and all that. And he then saw that he didn't have to go out feeding and risking his liberty. All he had to do was be with Spot, open up a couple of joints in, in, in solo, had the spills like the big, big dice games and card games there, and he was getting even more out of what he was getting out of school without risking his liberty. So he was, he was sitting in a lovely position. 
in Needwood Spot, he'll now move in on any West End gambling club he fancied, using the muscle of Sonny Sullivan and his brother Slip. We just walked into the club saying, I didn't do the talking. He was very calm, very polite in me supply until he was upset. And uh, he was very, very polite and he said, uh, you ain't doing too well here, are you? So, well, we, uh, we could make this a lot better, you know. You better, we'll be in here. We come in and we'll make the play. And we, we had half the club then. For being a priest, now he's a gangster. He's still, he sees himself as a, as a, as a lucky Luciano now, you know. So anyway, uh, up one or two speeders in his cello. And all the good things of the day, all the top things of the day, Dan used to go to this spill, it was regular, everybody went there, I went there, everybody went there. He used to play the night away gambling. He used to play like dice, good, good games of, of, of rummy, or kaluki, but big money, because they had packets of money and put them all out feeding. They all what they put you call good money getters. In other words, they could be like skin today, but have uh, 30, 40, 50 grand in their pocket the next day. By now, Hill himself was setting up the most audacious robberies of all. In 1952, a team of his stole more than £200,000 from a post office van. No one was charged, the money was never recovered, and each robber was £15,000 richer. One promptly lost the lot in a crooked game run by Hill. In revenge, he tried to rob Hill's safe, but was caught red-handed. He accused me, rightly, of trying to take his money. So I said, that's right. He said, well, he said, you're a friend of mine. Don't you think you're taking a liberty? I said, Bill, I said, you've been taking liberties all your life. I said, how about the money you've taken off me in these crooked games? I said, what I was going to, it was 60 odd thousand pounds at this bit of the night. I said, what that money was is only a fraction of what you've nicked off from me in these crooked games. Hill was now making so much money and had so large a gang on his payroll that he decided he didn't need Jack Spot anymore. Their alliance fell apart when Spot finally realized what was going on. And behind my back is pain in my life away. What a bastard, eh? If anybody's a yip, you don't want no yip to be a governor. Anything then, he wrote a book to be king of the underworld, boss of London's underworld or something like that. And to counteract it, at the same time, within a month, Spots come out with a book, king of the underworld or something. And they both want to be seen as number one. Egoist, you see, nutters, right? While Hill plotted Spots down for in Clubland, Spot had to face a separate challenge from Alberto Di Meo, better known in the underworld as Albert Dimes the leader of a rising generation of Anglo-Italians. Albert took me under his wings and me and Albert were like brothers. We went together everywhere. Every day we was, we, we, we was together. We used to go to the West End and um, we had uh, a couple of uh, clubs of our own and uh, we used to go racing, making a book at the races and uh, we had uh, one or two uh, speeders clubs and uh, we, we got a living. And uh, once we got, we went in the ice cream business together, me and Albert. It was in the races that Albert Dimes chose to take on Jack Spot. One day, Dimes refused to pay protection money to Spot's aging lieutenant, Moisha Blueball, who was collecting from bookmakers on the track. Moisha Blueball said, well, Jack said, meaning Jack Spot, uh, Jack said it's so-and-so, as from now on. He said, I don't what Jack said, you're not getting no worse than all me. And that's it. Now, Moshe Blueball, now, says it's a challenge, doesn't it? He? he goes back and tells Spot, I got the money off everybody else, but Albert said, Jack. Spot was furious, especially when he heard tales that Dimes had been bad mouthing him on the racetracks and in the West End. In August 1955, he went to Soho to confront Dimes. I've been hearing stories about what he's going to do to me and all this, you see? And I go to Fripp Street, and there he is standing in Fripp Street. 
my food shop. I walk over and anything on the team, he runs away and goes into the fruit shop. I went in there and then he took a knife to try and cut me. You understand? There was two knives supposed to be used, but only one was used that he had. I had no knife. If Spot said, how about the two, that's all rubbish. Because, because no way would Spot have left the West End at East End and got, made his way to Albert to have a confrontation with Albert without something in his hand, whether it be a knuckle duster or whether it be a tool or anything, right? So he brought the tool along, right? And he's called Albert with the tool. Steve didn't go Albert at all. In the shop, Dimes had some help from the fruiterer's wife. Well, the fruiterer's wife hit me on the head with the scales. Smash my head open with all the weights. I didn't know what it was all about. What did she have to do that for? The woman in the fruit shop probably saved Dimes' life and delivered him a famous victory. Both men were put on trial for the Battle of Frith Street, but both got off. It was the beginning of the end for Spot and the making of Dimes. He would not be now, but Dimes, he pounced on that victory. Billy left him up and said, well, he done Jack and all this crap, which he never, he never done me. I was about the next day looking for him again, you know. For all his bravado, Spot was no longer the hunter, but the hunted. In the heart of London's old Italian community, the friends of Albert Dines plotted revenge for Spot's attack. Yeah. Now, we do what we got to do. Whatever Spot had interest in went up near. He had, he had clubbed in the West End, they were smashed up, burnt down, whatever. Right, we went into all these, all these joints in the East End looking for Jack Spot. Right, one or two people got hurt, individuals got hurt. Now, Spot saw the right on the wall. He knew now uh, that the strength that he had weren't, wasn't forthcoming. Right, he would fell out with him. So now he realised, I lie. What's happened? I'm out in the cold here, right? So, now he's an individual. He's nothing, right? In the end, Spot was betrayed by one of his own people. Well, we had somebody in the Spot camp, because all we wanted to know was where we could cop for Spot. That's all we wanted to know. And we had somebody who Spot thought he could trust that was in there, that, alongside the Spot, that would tell us when Spot left his house. Night after night, Dimes' friends waited in the Central Club for news of Spot. Bert Rossi claims he got so bored he went dog racing. But meantime, his comrades had gone off to attack Spot as he left a restaurant with his wife. They start cutting me here. You understand? They cut me from here, down here. They cut my ear, you see, on the floor, which I picked up later and put in my pocket. They cut me, stabbed me in my back. If I showed you the scars all over me, you understand? And I survived. Four hundred stitches they give me. Oh, when you do the man, you don't care whether you kill him or not. No, do you? You're not you. If 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 you were just gonna hurt a man, you just you just give him, give him smash him, and that's the end of the story. But if you want to keep. Yeah, keep keep going to work, then you do want to kill him, don't you? That's what you want to do, don't you? He put all this on himself, but he didn't have to have done nothing done to him. He thought he was going to be Jack the Head, or as you put in the paper, King of London's Underworld. And he put it on himself, he wanted to be a king. But he was, he did, If he hadn't have attacked Albert, it wouldn't have happened. End of story, right? The mob attack made front page news. Spot's wife, Rita, became a heroine for allegedly fighting off his attackers. Soon the police arrested the obvious suspects, but Bert Rossi had fled to Ireland with Billy Bly, who was one of Spot's attackers. Weeks later, Scotland Yard detectives, acting on a tip-off, dragged them back. Now they put me in the cell here, and they put Bly in the cell there, right? All right. All of a sudden, I hear the shot of the 
steps in the corridor. They open up the cell door. They said, that this back. Well, they took the back of the staff and this is the disc, the SS. Which, uh, this is in Barrett and Green, out in London. So we open up the door and there's a bird standing there. I've never seen a big blue in my life. This spots old woman standing there with a couple of coppers around her. She looks at me. I don't even know what she's there for. What? Looks at me. She said, uh, yes, that's the man. Before I knew, before I knew anything else, they couldn't even say, what are you talking about? The door shut and they've done the same thing to Bill. That was our ID. In the cell, on my own, that's the man. Right? Because I told you, from the very beginning, she never saw a soul. Even though she was there when it happened, she never saw anybody. Because the people, I tell you, the people that went on that thing there were masked up. Rossi and four other men were put on trial. Spock was hauled in to exhibit his scars, but refused to give evidence. He excused himself that he couldn't see anything because, because uh, he was being uh, seen there. But the thing is, his wife gets in the box. Oh, yes, yes. She points at me, Bly, and Dennis. She said, yes, those three were there. I actually saw them do this and do this and do that. Now, you can't say to the judge, this is one load of rubbish, because everybody that did, well, they had a mask. Come here. So, don't take her word for it. On Rita Spock's word, Rossi was convicted and jailed for four years. Other men were jailed for seven. But with Jack Spock out of the action, Albert Dines was now top of the pile. Who should start snuggling up to him but Billy Hill? Billy was a cunning manipulator of men. Billy was a bad man. Billy, I don't work with Billy. But he was, he had no feeling, Billy. He wasn't a real minded man. Billy was a man that would use anybody, use you, and just drop you. He had no feeling, I don't work with Very, very unusual man, Billy. Anyway. Anyway, uh, now I could see it. So he started coming to the Central Club. Now he's piling up with Albert. See, uh, he was there too often for my run up on myself, and it's funny now. He's never been in here, he's always with Spot. All of us started now, Spot's hit the dust. He's here every night, you know. The alliance between Dimes and Hill meant there was no way back for Spot. In the early 1950s, he'd been collecting £3,000 a week from one gambling club alone. But in 1959, he was declared bankrupt. All down, he says, to Billy Hill. He meant to skin me, murder me, and kill me, but it, it, it only worked, he got me my money. He was a wicked nasty. He, he succeeded in destroying you. He destroyed me, not bodily. He destroyed me, but he left me a bit broke. But thank God I had a good wife and my lovely children, and I'm all right today. With Spock out of the game, in the 1960s, Albert Dines was the most respected gangster in London. But at the height of his power, he died. I was, I was, I was choked. Like a brother. I was choked. from good and lovely man. Yeah, choked. Died of cancer. That left Billy Hill. He had the rarest of gangsters' fates, a happy and prosperous retirement. But not before he had embraced two rising young East Enders, Ronald and Reginald Cray, who would make the era of Hill and Spot look tame. Thank you for watching.